Chapter 14, Part 2, Two Societies at War. So we're in the midst of the Civil War here. So Lincoln decides to change his strategy. Um, his strategy of a peace by compromise is what he was hoping would happen. But now he sees that it's got to be total war. So, so what does total war mean? It's a form of warfare that mobilizes all of a society's resources, including economic, political, cultural, in support of the military effort. Everybody gets involved, whether you're a soldier or not. So what's, what's happening on the home front? Well, it became about mobilizing armies and civilians on both sides. And initially, both sides were patriotic to their cause. A union recruit said, I don't think a young man ever went over all the considerations more carefully as I have. It might mean, it might mean sickness, wounds, loss of limb, or even life itself. But my country was in danger. So were the Union soldiers lining up to end slavery? And the truth is, no. The, the vast majority did it for honor and adventure and a sense of patriotic duty to preserve the Union. So it's, it's a myth of American history to think that the North rose up to end slavery. That was not the case, although it would be used later to justify the huge loss of life. But the South also rallied to the cause. Would you, my darling, be willing to leave your children under such a despotic Union government? No. I know you would sacrifice every comfort on earth rather than submit to it. This is a Southern enlistee. So the South uh, started a draft or conscription, compulsory military service. Uh, it, it called for three years of service for all men aged 18 to 35. And of course, they had to do this because they didn't have enough people. They had to draft. Uh, after the Battle of Antietam that we talked about, Sharpsburg, and the large number of casualties, the maximum age in the South is raised to 45. Mm -hmm. uh, women joined the war effort also on both sides, nurses, clerks, but also as factory workers in the North. And also in the North, women joined the Sanitary Commission and the Freedmen's Aid, Aid Bureau. Uh, both sides began to mobilize resources. And, of course, the South had to make the most of theirs because they had much less than what the North had available. But the South always had King Cotton, their leading export, and a crucial staple of the 19th century economy. So I, we talked about how the first couple of years of the war, the, the North was not doing very well. And you have this long line of incompetent generals in the first two years. But by 1863, the, the fortunes of the North began to change. <clears throat> they were becoming a more cohesive unit, uh, and, and uh, mostly because of a result of better leadership. And this is a quote from Henry Adams. Little by little, one began to feel that behind the chaos of Washington, power was taking shape, that it was massed and guided as it had never been before. Uh, so Henry Adams was the grandson of John Quincy Adams. We remember John Quincy and the corrupt bargain way back with Henry Clay and their defeat of Andrew Jackson in the uh, election of 1824. Mm. Uh, okay, let's, let's look at a film here about the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, please watch the film entitled The Emancipation Proclamation Explained U.S. History Review. Please watch that film and then come on back. Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture right here about the Emancipation Proclamation. This is number 15, so you've got this one and one more. I look at our outline here. Did it free all the slaves? So initially, Lincoln wanted to preserve the Union. He did not want to interfere with slavery. A higher cause. What does that mean? Getting ex-slaves uh, to fight. They want to fight. And... The war shifts from a war for union to a war for freedom. Uh, number three, who did it free? Uh, talk to me about the rebellious states and the border states and what was happening there with slaves. Number four is the 13th Amendment. What did this do? It abolished slavery, and it's considered to be a sacred moment in U.S. history. And, of course, as usual, at the end of the lecture, I will tell you the relevance. Okay, so, so we all know what the Emancipation Proclamation did. Like, what did it do? It freed the slaves. 
But did it really? Is that what it really did? So going back to the start of the war, Lincoln claimed that the purpose of the war was the preservation of the Union, not the abolition of slavery. Although he was personally against slavery, and he felt that it was an unqualified evil to, to the Negro, the white man, and the state. <clears throat> but initially, he was more concerned with saving the Union. In his first inaugural address, Lincoln declared that he had no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with slavery in the slaves where it exists. Uh, as the war began, Lincoln knew that neither Northerners nor the border slave states would support abolition as a war aim. But by, by, by mid-1862, as thousands of slaves fled to join the invading Northern armies, and they want to fight, but there's no vehicle to allow them to, Lincoln was convinced that abolition had become a sound military strategy as well as the morally correct path. And he saw, of course, all this possibility of adding all these soldiers, all these freed slaves. So, so Lincoln decides to issue the proclamation, but did it put an end to slavery? Uh, it declared that all persons held as slaves shall be then thenceforward and forever free. Um, these are hallowed and sacred words in American history, ones that are turned to to give an example of America's core values. Uh, this is one of America's great features. Uh, you know, to, to fix the things when they're wrong. So in this case, it was righting a wrong by freeing the slaves that had been argued about for over 200 years. That's a long time to argue. But but it's misleading because that's not exactly what it did. So when you're when you're looking at quotes like this, anytime you see three dots together here, that is called an ellipsis. So what that means is that the, that the writer has taken part of the quote out to just kind of get to the point. So so this this quote was longer than this. Those three dots, I'm telling you that I've taken part of this out. So let's let's look at the entire um, entire quote here. That on this first day of January in the year of our Lord one thousand eight hundred sixty five, and the parts in red were the original quote. All th all persons held as slaves, and here's the key: within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States shall be then thenceforward and forever free. So if you read the red part, all persons held as slaves shall be then thenceforward and forever free, it gives you the wrong impression because it only applied to the states that were in rebellion. The people whereof shall then be in rebellion. Uh, it only applied to the states that had seceded from the Union, leaving slavery untouched in the loyal border states. We talked about those four border states uh, that went both ways. You know, Lincoln did not free the slaves there because he didn't want to lose their loyalty. Uh, so if you were a slave in the border state of Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free you at all. So it doesn't seem very fair. But again, he did not want to lose their support. We, we can't afford to lose these states to go to the, go to the South. If we take away their slaves, they, they'll, they'll, they'll revolt and, and become Confederate. Uh, so Lincoln doesn't want to anger them and, and cause them to shift their support. So if you were a slave in one of these states, you remained a slave, you were not freed. Uh, the emancipation did not free you. Only the slaves in the Confederate states were freed. But, but seriously, what were the chances of that happening? The South was at war with the United States. They weren't about to listen to anything Lincoln said just because he declares that doesn't mean we're going to do it. If you're a Confederate and you're a farmer, and you've got sons fighting in the on the Confederate side, and then Lincoln, the, the president of the country you're fighting against, says all the slaves in Mississippi are free. You're not going to free them because he says so. Uh, the uh, it, it also exempted parts of the Confederacy that had come under Northern control. So if if a part of the South was under Northern control, it what they weren't freed there either. Uh, but most important, the, the freedom it promised depended upon, this is very important, 
The freedom it, it promised depended upon the Union military victory. It would have no relevance if the South won the war. So the North had to win that war for this to, to, to have precedence. So you could say the emancipation should have an asterisk after it that said this will only apply if the North wins the war. So the emancipation literally freed no one at its, at its inception. Mm -hmm. The emancipation was a military move uh, by Lincoln to create a greater cause for the war. You know, we know the military aspect had not been going well for the North. So he decided to free the slaves to create a drama. And again, of course, he realized that if we free them and allow them entrance into the military and the army, we're going to get a lot more people to, to fight with. Uh, and of course, he didn't need that, but why not get more if you can? Uh, so although the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery in the nation, it captured the hearts and imagination of millions of Americans. And it fundamentally transformed the character of the war, for, again, from one about union to one about freedom and American values. So after January 1st, 1863, every advance of federal troops expanded the domain of freedom. Uh, the proclamation announced the acceptance of black men into the Union Army and Navy, enabling the liberated to become liberators. And by the end of the war, almost 200,000 black soldiers and sailors had fought for the Union and freedom. But it was also a genius move in the sense that Lincoln knew that no European country would ever support the South after this proclamation. I mentioned before, England especially was considering backing the Confederacy and actually coming and bringing their army and navy to join the South and fight the North. Uh, much like the French had done when they backed the American colonists in the Revolution. Uh, but if this war was going to be defined as a war for or against slavery, you know, no country would want to be part of a war that condoned slavery. So England didn't want their fingerprints on a war that was fighting to promote slavery. So by, by issuing the proclamation, it, it appeared like it freed everybody, didn't free anybody, but it, it created this other scenario where um, you, you have a greater cause for the war, you get, you get more support, but also it really kept any European country from joining and backing the Confederacy. Uh, so, you know, a, a, a genius move by Lincoln, but, but hardly the foundation of civil rights like it's been promoted. <clears throat> but the careful planning of this document, you know, Lincoln waited uh, for just the right moment in the war, waiting for a victory. Of course, we know that that, that took a long time to, to come by. And he finally gets the Union victory at Antietam, although it was probably more of a, of a draw. Uh, but he, he used it anyway uh, to ensure that it would have a, a positive impact on the Union efforts and redefine the purpose of the war. Uh, <clears throat> so the proclamation provided the freed slaves with the support of the U.S. government, including the Army and Navy. It declared that free slaves should be paid a wage. It urged free slaves to abstain from violence except in self-defense. And it publicly declared that all suitable freed men would be accepted into the armed services to fight in the war. Of course, the emancipation brought shockwaves to the South. Uh, not that they didn't expect it on some level, but their chances of negotiating for a peace now, that a peace that would allow for the continuation of slavery in, in, their, in the South, now seemed remote. And they realized the only chance they had to preserve their way of life would be to win the war outright. And the chance of that happening after a very promising beginning was looking more and more remote. Uh, another positive result of the Emancipation Proclamation was the 13th Amendment to the Constitution that completely abolished slavery in the United States. But again, this would depend on the Union winning the war. But by 1863, as I've mentioned, this was becoming, seeming to be more likely. Uh, so Lincoln recognized that the Emancipation Proclamation was a war measure, but he realized 
but it might have no constitutional validity once the war was over. Uh, the legal framework of slavery would still exist in the former Confederate states. So the Republican Party committed itself to a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery completely. The overwhelmingly Republican Senate passed the 13th Amendment by more than the necessary two-thirds majority on April 8, 1864. <clears throat> but it wasn't until January 31st, 1865 when the House passed it by a bare two-thirds. And then by December 18, 18, 1865, eight months after the end of the war, so for eight months, even though the slaves were freed, technically and legally, they really weren't. Uh, so eight months after the war ends, the requisite three quarters of the states ratified the 13th Amendment, which ensured that forever after neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. So the 13th Amendment officially ended slavery in the United States, legally and in any other way. Okay, to wrap up the lecture, the relevance today, the Emancipation Proclamation continues to be a symbol of equality and social justice, although its reality in its beginning was really neither. It didn't free anybody. One more time, relevance today, the Emancipation Proclamation continues to be a symbol of equality and social justice, although its reality in its beginning was really neither. It didn't free anybody. Okay? That is, that is the end of uh, supplemental lecture number 15, the Emancipation Proclamation. So before we move on, let, let's watch a film that looks at the effects that the 13th Amendment continues to have in our present day. So, you know, it's a, it's a similar type of situation out there that happened at the end of the Civil War. Racial strife in the streets. You know, we still have it. We didn't solve it. I mentioned before in our last chapter on Reconstruction, we'll learn how, why that happened. Uh, please watch the, doc, the film entitled a uh, Ava DuVernay's Documentary 13th. And it's a different spin on how this 13th Amendment abolish slavery, but yet it can, on some level, you could argue it still goes on. So a, a, a controversial look at the 13th Amendment. Go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. So, you know, food for thought there. I mean, this was a, this is a, a, a tremendous documentary. It doesn't really matter what side of the fence you're on about it. It's worth seeing, uh, you know, a different take, uh, a a very modern take and a, perhaps a progressive take on this idea of mass incarcerations being kind of the same thing as slavery was, even though the 13th Amendment abolished it. Okay, moving on with our story. Um, 1863 saw the Union gain two major victories that made it obvious that the South would lose, and these battles happened at the same time, and both became Union victories on July 4th, 1863, on Independence Day. I mean, you couldn't write a better script. So Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Uh, uh, of course, these two battles happen happening simultaneously, but hundreds of miles apart. One's in Mississippi, one's in Pennsylvania. We'll look at Vicksburg first. <clears throat> and this goes on for a while. Uh, so Vicksburg, Mississippi, located on the river itself, the Mississippi River, a very strategic location. Uh, the on high ground above above the river. So anyone in command of that town also commanded the river itself. Uh, the campaign of Vicksburg would prove to be one of the Union's most successful campaigns of the war. Although Ulysses S. Grant's first attempt to take the city failed in the winter of 1862-63. So I mentioned before, Grant's coming south starts with with Forts Henry and Donelson, gets surprise attacked at Shiloh, but he does continue on to Corinth and, and, and you know, conquers Corinth and takes control of the rail lines. Now he's moving south further to his objective, which is Vicksburg. Uh, but his attempt to take the city 
from the north coming south failed because it's swampland and it was difficult to cross with all these troops. So he had to kind of retreat and regroup and figure out another way. Um, he, he realized, I've got to get my army below the city where there's an easier approach to, to you know, attack it. I can't attack it from the north. So I, I got to go past it and then come up from the south to attack it. And they try all kinds of different things. They, they, they try to cut a canal in the river where the, where the Union ships could bypass the city of Vicksburg so they wouldn't get destroyed. They try all these different things and, and nothing really works. So they finally come up with this idea. Admiral David Porter would run, of the Navy would run his flotilla past the Vicksburg defenses. Uh, so what they did is they turned out every light, no, no cigarettes, no cigars, no candles, no running lights, nothing. We're going to wait till, till the, there's no moon and we're going to do this very early in the morning, you know, after midnight, get pitch black. We're going to float our entire flotilla past the Vicksburg defenses. We're going to stay on the west side of the river, you know, across from the city so they don't see us so much and hope that this works out. A, a very, you know, uh, crazy idea, uh, but it works. Uh, the batteries at Vicksburg don't see them until the very, very end. Then they open fire and they, they actually took out a couple of ships, but the majority of, of the Navy got down below the city. Uh, Grant was marching his army further to the west down also kind of parallel to, to the, to the uh, Navy on the river, and they all meet up south of, of Vicksburg to, um, you know, uh, start their, their plan to come up from the north. <clears throat> uh, so Grant marches his army down the west bank opposite Vicksburg, crosses back to Mississippi, and comes up towards, uh, towards Vicksburg and defeats a Confederate force near Jackson, Mississippi. Then he turns towards Vicksburg, uh, coming from the east now, coming west. Uh, and he defeats the force under General John C. Pemberton. And as Pemberton retreated back to Vicksburg, uh, Grant surrounded the city uh, by the end of May. So in three weeks' time, Grant's men had marched 180 miles, won five battles, and captured 6,000 prisoners, and his navy floated by the batteries of, of Vicksburg and were not seen till the very, very end. A, a, a tremendous campaign. But the Confederates were entrenched inside the city. Uh, so Grant prepared for a long siege, that idea of surrounding a, a city and bombarding it until they run out of food and water. We talked about this a few times. Uh, so that uh, Pemberton's army knew this was coming, and they constructed 15 miles of trenches. And if you've ever been to Vicksburg, and I have, those trenches are still there. Vicksburg's a, 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 a pretty cool city to, to visit if you're into that kind of you know, battlefield stuff and Civil War. It's, it's, it's an interesting place. The river and the whole idea uh, is pretty nice. Uh, so, so Grant surrounds the city and encloses Pemberton's force of 29,000 men inside. And he continues to shell the city from May 18th to July 4th, Independence Day, a month and a half. To escape the continuous bombing, the residents of Vicksburg took to the hills outside of town and dug caves into the side of the building to survive because they, they, everything was getting blown up. <clears throat> uh, so pretty desperate, but, you know, the, the human, uh, you know, nature to, to try to survive. <clears throat> of course, only a matter of time before Grant, with 70,000 troops, captured Vicksburg, attempts to rescue Pemberton and his forces by the Confederates fail from both the east and the west. Uh, the conditions for both the military personnel and civilians deteriorated rapidly. And finally, Pemberton was forced to surrender on July 4th. Of course, Lincoln is overjoyed and claims the Mississippi River again goes unvexed to the sea. 
It's in Union hands, and there's nobody to stop us. Losing Vicksburg was a crippling blow to the Confederacy, you know, coupled with their loss of New Orleans. That had happened just right around that time. They had lost complete control of the Mississippi River. Uh, the town of Vicksburg would not celebrate the 4th of July for 81 years, not until 1944 at the height of the patriotism of World War II, because to them it meant defeat. Okay, our other battle, a battle of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So I mentioned before, this would be the other time of the, the, that Robert E. Lee would invade the North. First time was Antietam, Sharpsburg. Next is Gettysburg. Uh, in an attempt, again, to bring the war to the northern civilians and also to put his army into position to strike at Washington, D.C. If we can get up in Pennsylvania and maneuver ourselves in the right position where the Union Army, you know, is not in front of us, we can attack Washington, D.C. and maybe capture Lincoln or something. If we can capture that city, we may win the war. <clears throat> Uh, so in the summer of 1863, Lee launches his second invasion in the Northern Territory and, and was pursued first by Union General Joseph Hooker, then by General George Meade. So continued poor leadership in the North. Uh, although personally, I don't believe that George Meade should be put in that category. George Meade will win the Battle of Gettysburg, but where he's criticized is he didn't pursue Lee as Lee retreated, and he probably could have won the war right there if he had. Um, but not, not as bad as the others, okay? Uh, so Lincoln is still trying to find a competent general to manage his Army of the Potomac. So Lee comes north. He, he wants to score politically meaningful victories. He wants to take the war out of the ravaged Virginia farmland and gather supplies for his army. Uh, another of his objectives was to draw the, out the 90,000-man Union Army, destroy it, and hopefully march towards Washington. Um, so the two armies are in Pennsylvania, and they kind of lose touch with each other. Uh, uh, Lee's uh, 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 eyes and ears kind of failed him. I don't mean literally, but, but his scouts failed him, Jeb Stewart couldn't find him, and Lee didn't know where the, where the North Northern Army was. So they're both kind of looking around for each other, and they literally ran into each other at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, on July 1st. Uh, this is a small town. Uh, the Confederate Army, always under supply, came into the city looking for shoes and ran into the Northern Army. So there was some hard fighting inside the city limits. Uh, you know, the city of Gettysburg is also a very interesting place to visit. Uh, and the Confederates took charge and pushed the Federals into the fields west and north of town. Uh, but they were unable to secure the heights to the south. Uh, of course, heights again, high ground. You, you want to have the high ground. So even though the Union army was pushed out initially they were pushed into the high ground where they took that over and the tide kind of turned to, to their favor on the following day the second lee attacked the federals on the heights but failed to dislodge them on the third lee attacked the union center at cemetery ridge but was soundly defeated and this is now known as pickett's charge <coughs> perhaps the most famous moment of the Battle of Gettysburg. This was an infantry assault of approximately 15,000 Confederate soldiers uh, against General George Meade's troops positioned along Cemetery Ridge, manned by only 6,500 Federals, but they were in an entrenched defensive position. So you're talking about sending your men across open ground that was that was low ground, and you're, you're going to be going uphill to assault your your opponent where they are in a entrenched defensive line. This is not a good thing. You're going to get wiped out. This is a suicide mission. We talked about General Longstreet was Lee's right hand man before, and Longstreet, especially after Thomas uh, Stonewall Jackson was killed. Uh, uh, 
he was completely against this plan and the assault. And he tells General Lee that no troops can take the Union Center in a frontal assault. But Lee did not listen to him. Proving his determination had clouded his military judgment. He had made, Lee had made all the right calls so far, but he's not going to continue it here. He's going to stumble here at Gettysburg. The assault would take the nine southern brigades, 4,000 in, in one brigade of Confederate soldiers, over three-quarter mile of open ground that was susceptible to cannon fire the entire time. Uh, so although the Confederates had uh, more than twice the number, uh, a, a rare occurrence in this war, as they were the ones that, that was usually outnumbered, uh, didn't matter because the Union troops had the high ground and could fire on the exposed Confederates, crossing an open field of almost a mile long. So again, it amounted to a suicide mission and one that had very little hope of succeeding. Uh, the ill-fated assault resulted in 6,000 Confederate casualties versus only 1,500 for the North. Uh, after the battle, uh, as the Southern troops were retreating, uh, Lee wants to wants to you know organize and, and gather an assault again, and Lee saw Pickett by himself, and he says, General Pickett, you know, gather your division, prepare for a counterattack. And Pickett replied, General, I have no division. They're all gone. They were all killed. So Pickett's charge would mark the end of the Get Battle of Gettysburg, as well as Lee's last invasion of the North. And finally, from the North's perspective, Lee had been beaten soundly because he had made all the wrong calls. So the Southern Army retreated at Lee's order and left over 20,000 soldiers and officers dead on the battlefield. I mentioned before that you know, they can't replace that many. So this, this, this hurt them tremendously. An interesting aspect of this battle was the fact that Lee actually did have a clear path to invade Washington, D.C. Uh, Meade's men were in position to fight Lee, and that brought them away from being in place to defend Washington. So if Lee would have fainted toward Meade and then gone to, the, to his right, nobody would have stopped the Confederate Army from taking Washington, D.C. And Longstreet begged Lee to forget about me and the Union Army. Let's go after Washington, D.C. and maybe steal this war and win this war by marching around Union forces and attacking the capital. But Lee displayed a, a bizarre bullheadedness at this point in the war that he never had shown before, and Lee disagreed. And, of course, he's the commander, and he said... <clears throat> That is where the enemy is, and that is where I will fight them. So perhaps it was his southern pride, uh, again, honor, not being capable of turning away from a fight. There's the enemy. They are challenging me. I cannot back down and keep my honor intact. So that decision may have cost the Confederates the entire war. We would be in a very different country today if if. if if Lee had done the other and actually been successful in capturing Washington, they, they would have won the war. Uh, so he makes a, makes a huge blunder here. So his second invasion of the North had failed just like the first one and had resulted in heavy casualties. An estimated 51,000 soldiers uh, in all on both sides, killed, wounded, and captured, were listed as missing after Gettysburg. Uh, Pickett's charge was considered to be the high water mark of the Confederacy because it really was the, the, the furthest point that any Confederate army got to breaking the federal lines and breaking through. And if they had done that, they could have advanced on Washington. Um, I mean, they could have done it the other way, but they, if, if they were successful in, in their in their frontal assault and broke the Union line, they could have got to Washington that way too. And they actually do break through, but very quickly, and it was quickly, you know, closed up. And this is the point, and this is an actual, you know, sign at the, uh, at, at the Gettysburg Park. This is the, the, the point that the Confederate effort 
this is the farthest they got and it, everything went went against them from here this is this is their high water mark their best chance of winning this war was stopped right there uh, so these two Union victories on the same day that just so happened to be on Independence Day spells doom for the South but they would survive for two more years but they would never be the threat they had been both sides at this point knew what the outcome would be including the South uh, in November of 1863 only four months after the battle at Gettysburg Lincoln was invited to give a speech uh, at the official dedication ceremony for the National Cemetery of Gettysburg. So they, they build a cemetery on the battlefield to, to uh, you know, bury the northern dead. And although he was not the featured orator of that day, the first speaker spoke for two hours. That was the way speakers were in those days. When you got, when you got together for something like this, speakers would talk for a long time time imagine listening to somebody for two hours um, Lincoln came next and was very embarrassed because his speech was only 273 words and, and that's it right there which says the address uh, he thought oh my gosh I'm, I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself after this long uh, you know speech in front of me but this would become one of the most important speeches in American history. And in this very short speech, he invoked the principles of human equality contained in the Declaration of Independence and connected the sacrifices of the Civil War with the desire for a new birth of freedom, <clears throat> as well as the preservation of the Union created in 1776 and its ideal of self-government. Uh, let's go to another film here. This is another excerpt from the Ken Burns documentary about the Gettysburg Address, including a complete reading of it. <clears throat> Please watch the film, The Civil War, The Gettysburg Address, and then come on back. Okay, on June 1st, 1865, only a couple of months after Lincoln's assassination, so I'm moving forward a couple of years here, <clears throat> Senator Charles Sumner, so we remember Sumner was the man that was beaten by Preston Brooks with the cane and was out for four years. Sumner referred to the Gettysburg Address, which had been given by President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Sumner called the Gettysburg Address a monumental act and felt that Lincoln was mistaken that the world would little note nor long remember what we say here. Rather, Sumner claimed, the world noted at once what he said and will never cease to remember it. The battle itself was less important than the speech. Now, I don't know about that, but it, it was a tremendous, impactful moment and, again, a sacred speech in American history. But the war goes on. Uh, based on his successes in the West, uh, culminated by his impressive victory at Vicksburg, Lincoln named Grant the overall commander of all the Union armies. And what about uh, Grant's supposed drunkenness and drinking problem? Lincoln says, tell me what brand of whiskey that Grant drinks. I would like to send a barrel of it to my other generals. Whatever he drinks must be working. Let's get all these generals the same whiskey that he drinks. So after this long list, long line of failed Union commanders, McDowell, McClellan twice, Hooker, Burnside, Meade, finally the North had a commander that, that knew how to man maneuver an army. And after each engagement with Lee, win or lose, uh, Grant continued to, to pursue them. It's a very famous book by Bruce Catton, Grant Moves South. What, what does that mean? Prior to Grant taking charge, whenever the Union would engage in battle with the South, when the battle was over, win or lose, the, the North would go back to the North. But now, with Grant in charge, every time he engages Lee in battle, win or lose, he continues to pursue Lee South, and Lee knew it. Lee knew that Grant's a, a formidable opponent. He, this guy can can do this. Uh, Lee was was fearful that, that, that Grant had the, the right stuff to... to you know, do what had to be done. And right away he realizes when he sees that Grant's going to follow me and not let me get away. Uh, 
So Grant continues to pursue Lee no matter what happens. Instead of retreating north, Grant shadows Lee relentlessly and put Lee on a constant defensive. Uh, and he pursues himself, you know, and, and engaging in battle battles along the way, all the way to Petersburg, Virginia, where Lee gets bottled up inside and Grant again lays siege to the city, much like he'd done at Vicksburg. Uh, continually, sh constantly shelling the town. <coughs> Excuse me. But this siege lasts for nine months. Long, long time. Almost a year. Three quarters of a year. June 9th, 1864 to March 25th, 1865. And it, it, this, this battle devolved into trench warfare. A mindless back and forth battle. Each day winning some ground, next day losing ground. You know, neither side could gain an advantage. They're building trenches to try to get closer, and it just goes on and on and on. And what you're looking at is the start of modern warfare uh, because the, the weapons had far much more damage than the, the tactics that the generals were using, and they were forced to, to reinvent you know, uh, tactics based on the the uh, accuracy and the damage that these modern weapons were doing. Uh, while this was happening, uh, another part of the country, uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman, under Grant's orders, was moving on Atlanta, Georgia, and he invades and attacks Atlanta, and Atlanta fell as Sherman's army in early September 1864. So another, you know, uh, important city falls to the north. Uh, then he chased the Confederate troops through northern Virginia, I'm sorry, Georgia, in an attempt to lure them out into a decisive fight. But the Confederates knew better, and their evasive tactics doomed Sherman's plan. So, so Sherman developed an alternative strategy, destroy the South by laying waste to it, by laying waste to its economic and transportation infrastructure by bringing the war to the civilians and making them feel it. <clears throat> this became known as the Scorched Earth Campaign. Bring the ravages of war to the civilian population. Destroy farms, burn plantations to the ground, destroy foodstuffs and grains, steal horses, kill livestock, steal valuables to punish southern farmers and reduce their efforts for aiding in the Confederate effort. These farmers are growing the food that's feeding the Southern Army. Take away their ability to do that, and you're going to end this war. Uh, it is only those who have neither fired a shot nor heard the shrieks and groans of the wounded who cry aloud for blood. More vengeance, more desolation. War is hell, and I'm going to bring it to your doorstep. Uh, so Sherman's March, a famous moment of this, of this um, Civil War, began on November 15th when he cut the last telegraph wire that linked him to his superiors in the north. I can't, I'm going to be on the move, and I can't stay in contact. Trust me, I'll get back to you, Mr. Lincoln. Uh, so Sherman left Atlanta in flames and pointed his army south. And you see here from Atlanta, they're coming south, and they spread out, and they cut this kind of wide swath across the state of Virginia, and famously make Georgia howl, and they destroy everything in their path. Uh, let's go to another film here. Please watch the film entitled Sherman's March to the Sea, and then come on back. Okay, so, so no word was heard from him for the next five weeks, and Lincoln in the North had no idea what was going on. Uh, Sherman had told Lincoln his objective was the port of Savannah here at the bottom. Uh, and he let him know when he got there. So Sherman and his army of 65,000 go on this, you know, this, this violent and destructive uh, uh, campaign as they move towards Savannah. Plantations burned, crops destroyed, stores of food pillaged. Uh, Civilians assaulted, women assaulted. All these things happened in Sherman's march. And he left his calling card, Sherman neckties, where you tear up a railroad, heat up the rails, and then wrap them around a tree. 
Sherman's Sentinels, where you destroy a factory or a plantation, whatever, but all this left standing with the chimneys like Sentinels. Uh, along the way, his army was joined by thousands of former slaves who brought up the rear of the march because they had no other place to go. Where do we go? We're free. Follow the, follow the army that freed us. Uh, Sherman finally reached Savannah on December 22nd. And two days later, Sherman telegraphed President Lincoln with the message, I beg to present to you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah. So the loss of Atlanta and the destruction caused by Sherman in Georgia and the loss of Savannah also was another nail in the coffin for the Confederacy. Uh, Sherman would stay in, in Savannah until the end of January and then continued his scorched earth campaign through the Carolinas. Uh, going back to politics, even though there's a war going on, there's still a presidential election. Uh, the election of 1864 found Lincoln versus who? George McClellan, that overcautious person that didn't want to use his army. Yes, he, he runs against Lincoln. Uh, so although the fortunes of the Northern Army had improved greatly, Lincoln was far from a popular president by this election. The American public remembered all of his issues with his failed commanders. Uh, so Lincoln's chances for re-election actually appeared dim for much of 1864. Uh, no president had won a second term since Andrew Jackson nearly 30 years earlier. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln was weakened by widespread criticism of his handling of the war. The Union had suffered a long string of disappointments, and many faulted the president's strategy. Also, conservative forces in the North were outraged by the Emancipation Proclamation uh, and feared its impact on the future of society in general. Uh, but Lincoln was selected on the first ballot and was renominated and chose Andrew Johnson of Tennessee as his vice president. A uh, very kind of prophetic moment that will come back to haunt everybody. Uh, because this will be the person that will turn the end of this war and reconstruction into an absolute failure. But but Lincoln's trying to bring in a Southerner, and this is a Democrat also. But he figured if the South sees that one of their own is the vice president when the war is over, which by now he knows he's going to win, they'll, they'll be more apt to come back. Uh, but like I said, this will come back to haunt him in a huge way. Although the truth is he'll he'll be gone before that happens. Uh, so Lincoln promised to prosecute the war effort until the Confederacy until the Confederacy's unconditional surrender. We're not going to give you any break. We're here to to defeat you. Uh, the Democrats adopted a platform that called for a ceasefire. Uh, and, and a negotiated settlement with the South, which would probably mean the continuation of slavery. And that was George McClellan's plan. And this is how he felt about Abraham Lincoln, that of course, who of course had fired him twice. The president is no more than a well-meaning baboon. I went to the White House directly after tea, where I found the original gorilla, about as intelligent as ever, what a specimen to be at the head of our affairs now. So, of course, he doesn't care much for him, pretty clearly. Uh, so the overly cautious general who was afraid to use his army uh, now simply pledges to conduct the war more skillfully than Lincoln. Uh, but even then, people were... He was a popular choice, and it was not in any way a slam dunk for Lincoln to win, to win this election. <clears throat> but the turning point came in early September with Sherman's capture of Atlanta. You know, that victory lifted spirits throughout the North and revitalized the Lincoln campaign. And Lincoln, uh, I'm sorry, Republicans warned the voters, you know, don't swap horses in the middle of the stream. We've come this far together. We're almost there. This war is almost over. Don't change direction and allow McClellan and the Democrats to potentially negotiate and continue slavery. Let's keep going. We're almost there. Uh, 
So McClellan managed to capture 45% of the popular vote, a, a respectable showing, but the electoral tally was a landslide for Lincoln, and he was elected to a second term. So as 1865 began, it was just a matter of time for the Confederacy. By this time, over 100,000 men had deserted the Confederate Army. Common men were angry about the abilities of the wealthy plantation owners to buy their way out of serving. An Alabama farmer said, all they want is to get you to fight for their infernal Negroes. We talked before about the yeoman farmers that, that, that didn't ever start an abolition movement. You, you would have thought that they would have been kind of prone to do that because of the competition of these big plantations. But no, they, they wanted to rise up and, and have a big plantation themselves one day. But now, at the end of this war, they realized that was a bad mistake. And they realized that this whole war was fought for these wealthy men at the top. And they don't want anything to do with it any further. <clears throat> so back in Petersburg, Grant finally broke the stalemate and broke through the, the southern line. Uh, Lee is forced to uh, abandon both Petersburg and the capital of Richmond and is on the run retreating to the, to the west of Virginia. Uh, Lincoln famously tours Richmond after it was evacuated by the Confederates and the only people left there were the slaves. You see, the, it was, of course, completely bombed out. And all the slaves came up to him as if he was a god because this, this, is, this is our emancipator. Uh, so Grant chases Lee west across Virginia, finally meets him on the battlefield and defeats him at a place called Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. And this is where Lee formally surrenders to Grant. And essentially, the Civil War is over. Uh, uh, the Union had been preserved, and the slaves had been permanently freed. It all seems good, if you're a northerner anyway. This war is over, you're successful, you're victorious. But then a shockwave was sent through the country. And we'll open up with that in Chapter 15. That is the end of Chapter 14. Thank you.